Hi all, I hope you can hear me. I hope my internet's okay. Um, my name's Theo. I've been going to the London PSC meeting for just a few months. Um, it's really good to see all of you here who can make it. We've been really looking forward to this event. Um, we'd like to apologize sincerely to those people who can't make it or who have had to make different arrangements to be here. Um, hopefully the recording will be able, we'll get that out to everyone who's got tickets. Um, we also wanted to recognize as well that with the social and political context, it's an emotional time and has been very tiring for many. And so we appreciate people coming. Um, we'll be trying to think about how psychology and capitalism also implicate social justice issues such as white supremacy and racism. And PSC are also looking to organize a separate event to focus more on those issues in the future. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce the very thoughtful and engaging Ron Roberts. Dr. Roberts is a chartered psychologist with many years of experience in higher education. He has previously worked across seven of London's top universities and given us a large collection of interesting and thought-provoking articles and books on psychology and its relationship with war and terrorism, power psychology, health psychology, and capitalism. I found reading his work has given words, life, and answers to my frustrations and anger towards the status of, to the, toward the status quo of psychology and its disconnection from the political, historical, and social, and indeed the wholeness of people and their emotions. So a very warm welcome to Dr. Ron Roberts. Hey, thank you. Um, let's, let's hope I can live up to that. <laughs> um, awful lot of ground to cover, and I hope I'll get through as much of it as I can. Unfortunately, I know I'll end up not doing as much as I'd like. But anyway, in some sense, what I want to talk to you about tonight is the state of psychology and our psychological states, the relationship between those two and the wider kind of system of political economy which we're uh, embroiled in and, and how we, to some extent, we can free ourselves practically and mentally from that. Um, now, I, I arrived at this, I haven't realised for years when I, uh, in various psychology departments, and I haven't spent some time in public health departments as well, that there was something seriously the matter with psychology. Um, uh, and I realised this particularly after I did this book on just war, just after the Iraq war, um, it seemed to arise the ire of uh, the institution in which I was working in, but also, you know, our professional body, the Psychological Society, who were not too pleased with it. And various other things, the kind of issues in student mental health that I did, some stuff on the uh, state of former Yugoslavia and psychology's disengagement from political issues. I began to think there was something really, really fundamentally wrong with it, which I've kind of not really brought into my own awareness for years. So I began to kind of decided I must systematically sit down and uh, kind of explore that and put together what I thought and the result uh, was this book, Psychology and Capitalism. And um, I'll put the slide up later which kind of summarises this, but at the moment I'm going to go through this, you know, bit by bit. But I would summarise the relationship between psychology and, say, capitalism. Um, under five kind of distinct headings. And in some sense, in, in relating psychology to capitalism, what I'm implicitly proposing is whatever system of political economy we have, there'll be some relationship to it because we cannot free our way of thinking about people and the human condition from the conditions on, in which we live. So um, I'm taking what Kelly, George Kelly, that's a personal constant guy, used to acknowledge there's no value-free psychology and um, so you know I'm quite explicit that my version of it is value-laden and the version we're, be, we're presented with officially is one that pretends not to be. So my first kind of point I would say is psychology appropriates human characteristics which are at least partly social and then transfers these theoretically and practically into the individual realm in such a way that it basically conceals social relationships. And it's just this so effectively that what I'm about to say to some of you is going to be extremely strange. So I'm going to say such things as intelligence, memory, attitudes, personality, 
resilience are not individual characteristics. They're facets of the social world. Um, intelligence to take one, it's not what we measure in IQ tests. Human intelligence has always been a collective activity. If you look at, you know, science as an enterprise or art as an enterprise, it always involves huge complex social networks informing, discussing with one another to arrive at different perspectives. It's never been the case of um, some sole genius individual isolated from the rest of the world suddenly coming up with something that no one else remotely could possibly dream of. I'm reminded of that great quote by uh, the physicist Isaac Newton, obviously Newton's been <laughs> dead a few years now, he said, it, Newton, of course, came out with the theory of uh, universal gravitation. He said, if you think my work is astonishing and fantastic and all the rest of it, it's only because I've stood on the shoulders of great people before me. And I am basically like a small boy with a great ocean of truth lying in front of me. Newton, 400 years ago, was aware it was a social thought, human thought and activity and attempt to make sense of the world was a collective endeavor. But we tend to think that memory is something located inside our head. It doesn't exist in our relationships with the outside world. But one of the things that the collapse of the Iron Curtain told us is these kind of memories from Eastern Europe have reawakened and started to infiltrate the West, what we conceive of the West, is that our versions of the past are not necessarily congruent with other people's. And yet our individual realities are constructed on individual versions of the past, our own individual memories of the life, are formed from our social relationships with other people. It's hard to think of an instant in, instance in the past which doesn't have embodied in it in some way or other social relationships. So um, that's my first kind of point. Um, let's take another one, resilience. We've Psychology has promoted this idea, you know, of individualism, obviously psychiatry, psychotherapy, counselling. The side profession is the individuals, and I've done all this. And we've come up with this individual characteristic of hardiness or resilience, which distinguishes those people who succumb to the, you know, the um, chores, if you like, of living in, in, in present-day society. But really, resilience, again, is a, is a kind of issue of social connectedness and how well, how cohesive are the social communities and groups and localities in which we live? How well connected are we with other people? Um, uh, maybe to labor the point a little bit, um, all the great social changes and some of the not so great ones, but all the results of social action um, and they've re necessitated a, a, a massive degree of resistance to the ongoing social, the ongoing tyrannical social norms. So I'm arguing resilience is also um, a social property that we may gain from and participate in as an individual, but we're, we're but that's our own resilience is an expression of our social relationships, connections, our social history, etc. And if we take things like um, attitudes, um, psychology has the notion of a stereotype, um, which why should a whole series of different individual people in society all have the same kind of rigid, ridiculous view about some other kind of human group? If we were really following individualism to its logical conclusion, we'd have to come up with a different explanation for every single person of the state of attitude. Whereas the obvious thing is we're all living in a kind of common society in which these kind of representations of particular people are fed to us and we've effectively internalized these from the social world. So my first point, psychology is um, concealing social relationships. Uh, one thing I haven't got time to talk about, unfortunately, which I would love to in relation to this, is the whole idea of individual freedom and how it's been taken from 
really internalized from the whole idea of the Greek polis in which debate, where debate was public, and we've now internalized this into an internal theater of the mind, which we call you know, where our free will resides. Okay, so we uh, conceal social relationships. Psychology perpetu perpetuates alienation. The human beings constructed as material objects subjected to cause and effect relationships, principally, um, the discipline tells us these are the genetic influences or environmental influences. And, and we, the hapless human beings, are like caught in the middle of these kind of ping pong ball forces rather than viewing ourselves as active agents. Um, even very radical aspects of psychology has kind of fallen for this in some shape or form. I mean, Foucault's stuff on discourse of this um, force in history. Um, doesn't have any kind of human agency attached to it at all. Um, and Foucault himself directly negates the notion of human free will, which in itself would negate the whole prospects of liberation, emancipatory psychologies and disciplines and why we should have them or need them. Uh, so alienation, we're alienated from ourselves. We, the discipline presents us as not in charge of our own actions. And we present this and teach this to students as if we were talking about some other form of knowledge other than ourselves and our lives and how we live them. So we become alienated from ourselves. We become alienated from other people. We're clearly alienated from work, in which a lot of the things we do and are forced to do are, are not enacting our own will, but enacting the will of other people, bosses, um, the people um, who dictate what is appropriate knowledge or discipline in the academic world it's what kind of stuff we ought to publish in order to succeed and get on and then there's mystification these two kind of Marxist concepts alienation and mystification what now um, I'll give a kind of very technical definition of mystification in a minute but it's kind of gaining a new credence, a new kind of currency on the gaslighting, which is misrepresenting people's reality as they experience it. And I've got a nice little, this is the original one that I went with, which was from, from R.D. Lang, and he defined mystification as the substitution of false for true constructions of what is being experienced, being done, or going on, and the substitution of false issues for the actual issues. So I know there's an example of this yesterday with Boris Johnson, talking about what we're all in, you know, it's the statue wars rather than racism. Um, so we ought to be obsessed whether, you know, he's misrepresenting the issue as whether we all want to take down Winston Churchill's statue. Lang goes on. If we detect mystification, we're related to the presence of a conflict of some kind that is being evaded. The mystified person is unable to see the authentic conflict and they may experience false peace, false calm, or inauthentic conflict and confusion over false issues. So psychology just participates in this considerably in mystifying the reality. All these things, these points, these five major points I'm going to highlight, all feed into one another. If psychology is appropriate in human uh, social characteristics as individual ones, then it's misrepresenting reality. And it's mystifying us about the nature of the social world that we inhabit. Um, thirdly, Psychology promotes mental health system oppression. Again, problems are sourced as individual ones we were allegedly to suffer from are the structural organic defects in our postulated brain chemistry or, or genetic makeup, or psychologically in our deficient coping mechanisms and levels of resilience or hardiness, which are found wanting to cope with the harsh world we live in. And so this leads to the psychologization of political problems. Um, and again, you find this right across the political spectrum. So during the Iraq war, we I saw people on the left equally talking about that Tony Blair was mentally ill, and so was George Bush. We get it now saying that Trump is, saying that they can reduce the kind of political problems to the psychological problems of individual political leaders. Um, again, that's, this is mystifying us saying we are trying to present a very very simple view of reality 
Fourthly, psychology promotes surveillance, militarism, and social control. Um, militarism, psychologists participated, face recognition, uh, artificial intelligence, um, sleep research, how well, premise of the notion of how well the can soldiers function in combat zones. That's what's driven all of sleep research. The CIA basically front-ended funding for cognitive psychology in the 1950s. And basically, the former head of the CIA said, the shape of cognitive psychology today is how we basically shaped and structured it for our research interests. He said, you won't find the people who will be funded owning up to it. Uh, we've got psychological operations in, in war. Uh, in addition, we have um, marketing, advertising, business psychology, behavioral economics, nudge psychology. Psychology is close links with economics, which have been there since its inception, when what was a very, very initially 300 odd years ago was called political arithmetic. The first kind of beginnings of statistical science was really the beginnings of economics and psychology as scientific disciplines to categorize um to categorize people and this leads us back into the mental health system and our uh obsession if you like with categorizing people uh, and creating false social norms um psychology's history has been imbued with trying to please the status quo and its rise to prominence has been in some measure a reward for that some of our Technologies, the twin study method has its roots in Nazi Germany, for example. Um, Kalman and Slater, I think it was, the twin study method was predominated on eugenics. The history of IQ tests and, and the kind of racist links between that uh, are all heavily rooted in eugenics. And there's a whole history that's really discussed in psychological texts of how kind of sense racism has kind of permeated both cognitive psychology and kind of mental health. And certainly when we go back and look at some of the things, I mean, Thomas Sass drew, drew attention to this. Um, one of the kind of categories of mental disorder, which the uh, psychiatrists were happy to promote at one point, draped the mania, was uh, uh, diagnosed on the basis of uh, black slaves trying to escape uh, from their captors. Um, so this... Ron, sorry to, this is Sally speaking. We've just had a request, sorry to interrupt you mid-flow, and I hope I did, but we, we've had a request if you could put the slide up now. Okay. Is that okay? Um, you can share the screen. Yeah, so, okay. Everyone see that okay now? Yeah, lovely, great. Okay. Um, <laughs> One of the things that this led me, this particularly this fourth one, is that I think psychology is always to be found at the scene of the crime. So it's there at the Holocaust. Eugenics is a real private, prime intellectual driver of the whole project. And psychology is at the scene of the crime. In the subversion of democracies and the various elections across the world in the last, in very recent years, nudge psychology. Cambridge Analytica, etc. Psychologists are again at the scene of a crime. And uh, I've, I've argued we'll be at the scene of the crime in, in future. Fifthly, again, the result of all these kind of processes, psychology depoliticizes social space. And what are really fundamentally moral and political problems are reframed as scientific and technical ones. Um, about in a sense how to what's the word I'm looking for um, manage human beings um, th these led me all to kind of wonder what was this a legitimate discipline um, is it a coherent discipline at all I think a lot of us think it's actually not a coherent discipline when it first appeared in the 16th century as a term, it was regarded as the study of the soul, which basically nobody in psychology believes in. Um, Kant at the time, the philosopher Immanuel Kant, basically said this cannot be a coherent scientific discipline because it has 
no axiom, it has no axioms, it has no system of organized knowledge, premises, and theories about what it is to be a human being. A problem which the Kent Gergen restated in the 19, late 70s, 1980s or something. So we're still grappling with these problems. So it's led, led me to wonder, led me to wonder, um, how do we approach the future? And in one sense, do we need the discipline of psychology at all? Or do we need something about the human condition, which is my favorite way of looking at it. Do we need the discipline of the human condition that still embodies a psychological perspective, uh, but doesn't privilege it uh, and allows, not, not again, not, doesn't privilege a scientific discourse, can allow what used to be acknowledged in psychology when I was an undergraduate, that psychology, the art of living, it was an art. And to comment on the human condition could be an artistic enterprise. Um, how am I doing for time, Sally? Uh, you've got about five minutes left. Got about five minutes, okay. Um, so yeah, so in, in the, in the follow-up to this, I started to explore what an, what an alternative kind of non-psychology kind of psychology could be, but, 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 but still, in a sense, transcended all these kind of problems, but still was exploring about what it means to be a human being and address the problems of living. And then, obviously, I came up with my own version of this, but I think there's kind of multiple versions to be had. Um, I kind of put up front the issue of how we live in physical geographical space, a kind of psychogeography, as well as the kind of psycho, it's really a psycho historical geography, which positions us as historical actors. Um, one of the recent pieces of work I've just finished was looking at the Huxley family over four generations, it's kind of in-depth intergenerational study of how our ideas were passed on through generations and were cross-linked with the kind of social mores of the day. So that the Huxley family fed off these and society promoted this idea of individual genius which the Huxleys as a family unit fed on and promoted themselves and they mutually promoted one another. Whilst collectively we lost sight again of the social production of knowledge. Um, so we have socially historically embedded within space, how we move through physical space, how we feel when we move through it, what kind of issues when we're out in the street influence our state of minds. I look at the city as a place where different emotions can be physically located in different space, in a different space. So well, the city of London may say where the, where the kind of emotions and motivations of greed, for example, are being concentrated. We may look at the West End where um, revelry, debauchery, fun and entertainment are being located. We may look at, in, in, in most major cities, there's red light zones where people seeking sexual pleasure may go to. Then there's kind of zones of po impoverishment and depression physically located in cities. Now, there's different kinds of moods concentrated and focused in different zones of uh, urban space. And there's something to be said about Similarly, rural space, which I'm less familiar with, as I'm a kind of uh, urban, <laughs> urban citizen for years. So this is like, this is a kind of psychogeography, and um, how can we accommodate psychology? This this understanding of, of human beings as a way of how to live well, not just as a political enterprise, but this ancient, what was the ancient philosophy, kind of Roman philosophers threw it up. But the problem of the so philosophy of the early Roman philosophers said was how to live well. And of course, I think one of the myths of psychology is psychology tells you how to live well. Uh, all you've got to do is ensure your coping mechanisms are okay, you know, go into a bit of mindfulness, maybe practice. Um, um, a bit of cognitive 
behavioral techniques. Take the happy pills and you can be this ideal, individualized, happy citizen, uh, at peace with the world. Um, and maybe we don't want to be at peace with the world at all. Um, you know, psychology has promoted the happiness industry. And we've had well-meaning people say we want to move away from measuring the state of the economy by economic growth and sort of put in terms of happiness. A possibly equally dangerous enterprise. Uh, so there's a whole variety of problems there. How do you overcome alienation? How do you know you're mystified? How are these things possible to, to gain? Can we truly wake up? What does it mean to wake up? Um, and there's, there's a continual war over language here as, as we throw out new terms to try and free ourselves and then the opposition, the reactionary forces in society, um, tries to appropriate them. So, yeah, I think that's be five minutes, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, uh, so, yeah. I, yeah, so I'll leave the slide up, shall I? Yes, I'll, I'll leave the slide up. I, yeah, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, so I was just going to say, um, so we'll open up to questions from, the audience and we've got a couple as well if um to um i think one of the main questions that we were thinking about asking was i think you've already given some voice to but thinking about the ideas of alienation and mystification and how these relate to social issues and thinking specifically about the current climate and white supremacy white supremacy and racism how alienation yeah, I'll, add, I'll add a little bit to that because it wasn't like a could have mentioned which, which slipped me mind. One of the things which psychology does is it reifies the logic of industrial production as a set of interiorized psychological states. So hence, you know, or how, in a sense, these social characteristics can be seen as individual ones, but, um, you know, the selfish genes, the economically self-fulfilled person, The logic that we follow in science of emotional neutrality, objectivity, and universality in knowledge are basically premised on imperialism. The ways in which chiefly white privileged ruling class, owning class males for the most part sought to impose their power on the rest of the world. And it's interesting that it's the height of imperialism, the height of the British Empire which coincides with the beginning of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment itself was just a term that was current, that occurred simultaneously when the city streets first started to be lit, to the point, I think, in the mid 17th, early to mid 17th century. But this whole idea of how we follow and pursue knowledge is basically, it's gendered, it's, class-based and it's situated in white, white privilege. Um, and that is so infected every way in which we look. And I mean, I think people will still argue with, we seek universal truths, objectivity is fine, um, distance in between people we research. Some of this has started to come under, admittedly, challenge kind of qualitative oriented psychologists are sought to, you know, particularly in feminism and, um, and uh, black psychologists have sought to kind of question these kind of things and look at people's lived experience and question the role of power in our lives. Um, the question does come through is what, what would a de-ideologized, sorry, what would a psychology look like on a different ideological system? Uh, I don't know. Is, is the antidote was captured within this one. It's certainly true in the Soviet system, it didn't look very different to this. The Soviet system still sent people to the gulag, suffering 
political people um, suffering from sluggish schizophrenia for basically engaging in political protest. Um, forms of internalized oppression we would recognize were widespread in the Soviet system where people denounce wide, long standing communists who were, were, were denounced stood up and, and self denounced themselves, admittedly saying, I don't know what I've done wrong, but if Comrade Stalin and the party say I've done something wrong, then I must have. Um, a different ideological system. Um, yeah, that's what that's what's the thing. I think it's it's a kind of idealized. I'll show you when that's someone else coming in a minute. It's. Um, I think we need to just try and free ourselves from this one to imagine a different world. And um, yeah, I think okay. Maybe in my personal life would be it'd be a more more artistic, less scientific, more collective, more fun, more emotional uh, approach to life and to looking at ourselves. Okay, so somebody wanted to ask another question. Yeah, I think Alex had to hand up. Alex, are you able to unmute yourself and put your question across? Yes, yeah, so I from the chat, so I don't get the people writing in the chat, so I've followed a completely different system, I apologise. Um, it's kind of bouncing a little bit off of, uh, I think it was Cheryl's question about um, what would psychology look under a different ideological system. I kind of was thinking when you were talking about um, psychological geography about the idea of conflicting by James. I can't hear you too well, Alex. Um, I can hear all the people here, Alex. Okay. Sorry. Um, I was so she, the question I think is um, does, because you are breaking up a little bit, Alex, so if I've got this wrong, does psychology, does capitalism need psychology? Great question. Um, is, that, is, is that right, Alex? You could add to, into your chat if, if, if I've. She, she said a lot more, but it was a little bit... Yeah, something I didn't really talk about. Psychological governance is actually at the heart of contemporary capitalism. The control of states... I mean, if you look at higher education, for example, loads of us in higher education, student satisfaction. We're policing that affect people's constructed, alleged states of mind, or states of feeling, are central to the economy. Emotional labour resides uh, in, in huge numbers of industries. Uh, you've got to keep the customer happy, you've got to please them, so you've got to fake your own emotions to engage in kind of false social interactions. Um, the nut psychology is, is probably the most important example of that, of influence and mass psychology. And maybe it's always been important, that's what propaganda's always been about, uh, is shaping people's compliance with the system we live in the Joe Voss calls this, uh, what does he call it? It's like almost like the, he, he equates our kind of psychological state of mind related to capitalism, some akin to a stock, uh, the, the Stockholm syndrome. Um, so yes, as soon as we, we start to rebel and question, uh, they become very frightened. How does that be? It, it, so yes, it's massively important. Um, if, if, if you look at the rise of prominence of you know, improved access to psychological therapies, government now supporting improved access to psychological therapies, CBT and so on, the, uh, which is effectively the, the role of all these things is to get people into work, to make them compliant, obedient workers. Psychology is playing a pivotal role in that. Um, so, yes, I think if we unhinge and decouple psychology's relationship to capitalism and increasingly challenge it, we weaken capitalism. Uh, which is fundamentally, our, our capitalist realism, as kind of Mark Fisher used to, used to say, was premised on, on this notion of psych psychological realism, that we can't imagine the death of capitalism. People, if you look at science fiction, they, they imagine the rise and fall of civilizations, but capitalism always goes on. Fully enough, so does psychiatry in these kind of films as well, which can tend to suggest that they are intimately linked as something we cannot question. So yeah, there's a mental struggle, clearly, with it. But the discipline is so closely tied to it. I mean, military, uh, contemporary industrial capitalism is so tied to artificial intelligence, artificial mind. It's so closely related to psychology. Uh, so, in short, 
or maybe too long, I'd say yes, it's extremely importantly linked. It's such a great question. Ron, we've got probably one more question before we start going into breakout rooms. Um, okay. And it is whether therapy of any sort that has a focus on reducing distress acts to maintain the capitalist system. Another great question. It depends whether you call it therapy. If, if I say, are the things that people can do with one another to recover from distress, then the answer is yes. And sometimes people, good therapists and good practitioners, do these things anyway as kind of humane people. Sometimes people who are not therapists do these things intuitively. Anyway, um, are, the, are, are the forms of things which are therapeutic all within therapy? I'd say that's definitely not. You know, political protest is definitely very therapeutic. Mass political action can be very, very therapeutic in terms of releasing one's uh, role in part in collective power. So it depends what we call therapy. And again, it's a word which the, the system uses in a certain kind of way to promote the idea that there's something wrong with you, those of you who wish or are in need of it. I, I, it's, it's a really thought-provoking question there. Um, of which you know, we could write quite a lot more. Um, change is what we want. Change to live better is what we want. And are there things we can do to do that? And the answer is yes, we can do that with one another in therapy rooms and therapy situations, and we can do it outside them as well. And those things can feed back on one another. So maybe one, one, one corollary of that, or one implication of that question is, is the linking up of therapeutic dialogues between people into wider political dialogues and how that works or could work or might work. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ron. And thank you everyone for your questions and participating. And we're hoping that we'll be able to keep that discussion going. Um, so we're going to put people into random breakout rooms. Um, and you've probably got about 15 to 20 minutes time. So maybe coming back at eight o'clock. Um, but, and it, it might not be best given the short amount of time, um, probably best not to do introduction. That might eat away at your time for discussion. And um, we've also got some prompts, which I will put up here. Um, so Ron, if you stop sharing your screen, I can share mine and put up those prompts. Okay, right, let me wait you can choose, For sure. You can choose to, okay. So go ahead and choose one of those um, okay. Okay. prompts. I'll put them up in a second. Um, or if you like, follow obviously whatever train of thought that you are already on. Um, oh, here we go. And sorry, I just can't, not very good at multitasking. Um, but yeah, so then, and then we'll be able to come back and feed that back as well. Um, Shiv, I think you've got something to add on to that as well. Is that right? Yeah, just to say, um, we'll have a, like about two minutes per group for a little bit of feedback. So just bear that in mind um, if you want to collect, gather your points. I think there's a 60 second warning that comes up towards the end of the breakout discussions. So at that point, you might want to think about what points you want to feed back to the main group. But yeah, enjoy your discussions. Um, I mean, we were just having a conversation at the end before we got pulled in about, and I was just saying that. I guess in a really sort of idealistic world there wouldn't be a need for psychology because um, a lot of people's problems are sort of caused by other people and if we sort of dealt with things like rape culture then we wouldn't have to be supporting people with the trauma following rape and if we were able to sort of deal with poverty then again poverty which leads into the cycle of a lot of abuse and um, other difficulties then hopefully we wouldn't sort of have to there would be so much need for psychology. Um, so I guess that's kind of one thing. Um, and um, also about how sort of psychology is sort of quite attached to institutions. Um, so if we were to like move away from universities, then we may end up being joined to 
another institution that could be the BPS or the NHS, but maybe that institution could be more benign. Um, we were also talking about psychologists and sort of psychiatrists as perpetrators. Um, I mean, I mentioned David Bennett and the fact that we're talking a lot about abolition, but if we were to abolish the prison system and police system, um, there's been a lot of talk about maybe psychologists could be sort of providing support in these cases, but actually psychologists are quite a large part of the system um, and mental health professionals in general. And yeah, there have been cases where people have died in mental health custody and psychiatric custody. Um, I mean, if you think about Sarah Reed, she was failed so many times at so many different points. Um, and where was psychology there? Um, I think if, I don't know whether she did see any psychologists or psychiatrists, but I presume she must have seen someone and anyone really that she saw is as much part of her death as anybody else. Um, and um, we sort of talked a little bit about psychosis um, and psychologists um, as a sort of point of entry for people in sort of services that are particularly vulnerable, like psychosis services, and that they can hold the power for like huge changes to people's lives, like access to money, access to like general social support, and that that could be quite sort of dangerous. Um, and we also talked about anger, which can be sort of problematized as an emotion that is sort of not um, not a desirable emotion. Um, but actually, at, at times, anger can be quite helpful. And I guess right now we're seeing um, like Black Lives Matter protests. And like in the past, we've seen anger in sort of other civil rights movements and how um, at the time it's just really stigmatized and people are uh, in power are criticizing like Black Lives Matter protesters. And they, they criticize, although they sort of reflect on it as if they didn't, but they criticize Martin Luther King and they criticize Malcolm X. and and then it's only sort of in reflection that they look back at it as something, as anger in driving that as something that's positive. Um, and we talked about sort of self-defense and self-defense being quite um, empowering um, as well. I mean, I said that I got like way less harassment on I learned self-defense. So we're just sort of thinking about how that can actually transform a person. Um, I think that's kind of a brief overview of a lot of talking if anyone else wants to chip in if I've sort of missed anything important. But you've got it all then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amazing, you've co covered so much in such a short space of time. <laughs> um, anyone from the second group wants to maybe feedback the top, the, the, a couple of points from your group? This was a group that had Noreen and Rachel in it, if that helps. Um, I'll try and summarise as much as I can remember and others might want to chip in, but um, initially we started talking about the IAPT context and how that was kind of driven by this economic argument that it would be the best way to kind of alleviate psychological distress when actually it felt like there was a hidden agenda. And I said for myself, having worked on the front as a PWP for three years, today's presentation just helped to kind of reconnect with some of the that that I think um, uh, James used the term of McDonaldization, which is kind of like creating the system whereby people are kind of churned out in numbers, processed through a system, and it's all about reaching this kind of arbitrary um, level of recovery, but not actually translating into changed outcomes in terms of quality of life. It's all about this kind of drive to get people back into work, and that was the kind of premise at which. IAPT was built and it's become the model that has been adapted throughout mental health care because of that data drive and the fact that if we think about the hierarchy of evidence, the IAPT model is seen like the, the kind of the apex of evidence base, but then what other approaches are not privileged or not seen as kind of worthy or credible because of the way that the system has favored certain approaches over others. And we also talked a little bit about um, kind of what, what living well might, might look like and um, what that might translate to. And I spoke a little bit about kind of, for me, 
especially in the current context of what's been going on with Black Lives Matter, a lot of trauma has been happening within the Black community. And I believe that in order for us to find healing, there needs to be a community-based approach as well, because often there's a drive to um, pathologize what's going on as an individual deficit within people, and that needs to be fixed, and they need to kind of go to therapy for that, when actually this is a collective trauma, historical trauma. And for me, I think there's something about having a collective approach to this, because if trauma is happening within communities, healing also happens in communities. And I think that's what Breaking Mad, which I mentioned, is all about. It's about bringing communities together, finding healing, because we need to think about the historical context that has destructed the Black community in many ways, and kind of created these um, kind of split split communities through slavery, through colonialism, and actually what we need to do to heal is to come together as a community and find ways to um, kind of heal relationally and find an approach that works for us as a community in order to combat the, the juggernaut of capitalism and whiteness. So yeah, these are some of the things that we mentioned and we talked about how sometimes we as psychologists might also hold on dearly to some of these ideas. We benefit from capitalism too and we need to be honest about that. Um, and Kay also mentioned a little bit about what it means for us to challenge these systems because actually for some people who come to see us in the therapy room, much of their identity is shaped around failing because they're not able to provide for their families and they also privilege the idea of capitalism. Um, because it becomes so much part of people's identities. And when they fail to participate in economic activity, that then kind of manifests the psychological distress. So these were some of the, a flavor of what we discussed. And I probably missed so much more. And I'm really sorry for those who were in my group, if I missed anything out. That was a really fantastic feedback. Thanks, Noreen. Um, it sounds like you have some really yeah, I was going to use the word rich, but that sounds really trite. And um, someone in the comments there has posted it's the first time that they've heard um, racism and trauma be discussed in psychology like that since 1990. So I think what you've said is, is very eloquent. Thank you. I'm, I'm just, I'll just say a quick one thing. I'm just reminded, there's a, it's a quote from Alice Walker, resistance is the secret of joy. <laughs> kind of as a... It's something to, to bring together the psychological and the political in one nice little bundle. Anyway. Um, from group three, so that was the group that I was in. Um, anyone from that group want to give a, a bit of an overview of a, maybe a couple of the points that we discussed? Okay, I'll, um, I'll go, but then I'll need help because I... Like, I'll say what I remember. We talked about a bunch of things. Um, we talked about um, the intersection between um, these critiques of the relationship between capitalism and psychology on one hand and the methodologies that we use. Um, so we discussed how qualitative work, discourse analysis, other sorts of methods um, could be useful in mitigating some of these foundational um, critiques of the way psychology is being done. Um, we also talked about, we, we ended on a note of trying to self-critique um, how this relates to our own uh, work and there was a bit of um, a discussion around the intellectualization um, that goes on in academic circles in psychology and how, um, yeah, sometimes phenomena that should be discussed collectively become filled with jargon that makes them um, elitist and exclusive. Um, what else what did we talk about? Uh, we, we talked about whether there is a place at all for the, for the study of mental phenomena to be useful um, in our social justice work. So um, understanding all of these critiques of this concept of the individual and um, how things are much more multifaceted and social and relational. Does that leave any space for us to be interested in studying mental phenomena to begin with and what that would look like? Um, and we talked a lot about gaslighting, um, both within the academy and outside. Um, 
and how sometimes we're even made to, and I think some of the clinicians and the counselors brought up ideas of how um, sometimes they are made to feel bad about their own approach um, when it's social justice oriented, when they have too many emotions and too many experiences, it feels like we should um, rein it in. That's all I remember, but maybe someone wants to add other stuff. I think that covered from, yeah, from what I remember, I think that covers our discussion really well. Thank you. Um, we've got um, written feedback from group four, um, which I'm going to read out now. I wasn't in group four, so I don't know if anyone from group four wants to pitch in. Um, but the notes include that there was an attempt to make psychological safe spaces so that we don't question the fact whether these spaces should exist at all and we give credibility to unethical spaces instead. Um, we blame psychiatrists, psychology is as bad, we lack introspection. In an example where it is unethical or unsafe for someone to see a white psychologist, instead of finding an appropriate psychologist or potentially discussing, discussing political action or community psychology ideas, we just say, sorry, you've got no choice. The capitalist agenda within services encourages psychologists to do nothing, to not speak, not, not speak up because it affects targets. But this is not taking away from individual psychologists' responsibility. Psychology is good at ripping out the roots of certain approaches, for example, mindfulness and yoga. And money has been put into individual approaches, for example, treating, treating for a, ramif a ramification for social issues as opposed to collectivist approaches. Capitalism affects what it means to be well. So capitalism tells us what, what to be well is, to work, is to think about how we contribute to society. This links to IAPT. What is work? What is work wasn't an outcome. What if work wasn't an outcome? So capitalism is racism and slavery still exists. To challenge white supremacy is to challenge capitalism. Um, solutions include giving young people a space to think through things. We can't, so I can't pronounce this word, reify the situations. Um, political action and drawing on community psychology ideas. And when we make psychological, psychology so scarce, it makes us feel like it is our only option. So yeah, apologies if I misread any of those comments there. Is there anyone from Group 4 who wants to um, clarify anything that I've just read out? Nope. All right, so Group 5. Sally, can you remind us who was in Group 5? I mean, I'm happy to. Um, I definitely like some really good feedback. I kind of feel like, yeah, what they said, just all about that. <laughs> All of that stuff. Um, no, I'll do, I'll do a really good rundown. Um, and I also apologise for shaky internet. Um, so just let me know if you can't hear me. Um, essentially, we kind of looked, I think, again, IAPT came up as a really good example and a really good model from which we can kind of pull apart some of the problems um, that capitalism and psychology have um, and that how they're inherently um, tied together. Alongside that, we also spoke a lot about Mental Health Act. Um, and that brought up some ideas about um, the difference between um, reform and revolution and discussing about the idea of can we truly start to create or think about a new system when we're sitting in a system that's really broken? Do we put our efforts into changing bits and tweaking things when actually it's just them putting a sticky plaster over, over a major issue? Um, kind of thinking about off the back of that, the, the the discussions that are going around about kind of abolition of uh, police forces and the role that psychology might play in that. Is that a role that we should be playing or is there um, better people that can play that role? I think one of the questions that was asked when we were talking about um, abolition of things like the Mental Health Act or the revolution around those, those policies is who should be sitting at the table when discussing those. Um, and one of the questions that kind of was brought up was um, how do you get the elite to buy into it? Which kind of led to a conversation about um, the idea of profit motive being inherent in capitalism. It's its own kind of self-eating snake. It, it can't survive without this concept of profit motive. And so healthcare and mental health and distress have been marketized and have been considered something that you can make profit off of. And actually if we remove that idea from healthcare, no, elites aren't going to buy into it, but then we, we sidestep capitalism and we start to, I think as Ron described it quite nicely, weaken capitalism. Um, and that gives us a different framework 
to work within. Um, I think that was everything. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Alex. Yeah, interesting discussions. It's spotting a few themes coming up now as well. Um, finally, we've got group six, and I'm really sorry to rush you, but we only have like a minute. So if you could give us like your top two, maybe. <laughs> sorry. Got Katerina, Grace, Alison's breakout room. Um, so everyone's made really great points and I don't have much to say so um which is great because we haven't got that much time anyway but I think we kind of repeated what everyone said about um the IAP model and psychology's just becoming it feels like a tool to get workers to go back to work and feeding into that capitalist model I think even outside of the IAP services most services are running on like a budget and if you're not able to get your waiting list down or get people discharged at a certain time then it it you run the risk of having issues with funding which then puts more pressure on practitioners to kind of continue that kind of um model of trying to get people in and out as quickly as possible i think we spoke a bit about racism i think i really like what noreen mentioned about kind of generational trauma and not seeing racism as this kind of thing that happens as an isolated incident and something that shapes people's perspective in their everyday existence and understanding the power dynamics that you have um as being a clinician and um being a different class and being a different race and i think inherently psychologists all tend to come from a certain demographic they all tend to look like women come from a certain class come from a certain area and just kind of how difficult that might be especially in London which is quite um, a diverse city um, how you can kind of build a relationship and doing that under the constraints of service pressures so that's kind of what we spoke about a bit. Fantastic thanks Grace really relevant. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased to hear such um, fantastic feedback from the breakout room. It sounds like you had some really useful discussions. Um, so we're just going to hand over to Ron now. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left just for any sort of closing thoughts from Ron. Yes, yeah, some, great, some great thoughts out there. I, I love the idea that Grace on again about uh, the intergenerational trauma of racism. And I think it's the same for all forms of oppression. Class is class oppression is passed on you know know your place and all the rest of it ditto sexism these are all intergenerational traumas um and so you know they're all collective traumas in a sense as well and i think that's an incredibly important idea that we need to um do something with um it, it makes me realize listening to people that i've only really scraped the surface of um, and there's a lot more things for people to say that needs to be said that, uh, that it couldn't be me saying it kind of thing you know um, Thank you for providing such an amazing springboard for those discussions to, to be generated from Ron I think you've, you've provided a really interesting um, talk um, and I think your slide was really useful as well um, and so I will just say it took me a lifetime of struggle to come up with this. <laughs> um, in a sense, this was as much about my trying to make sense of my own non-career and why the work and things I was interested in, in work such as, you know, mm. being opposed to war, being opposed to sexism, being opposed to racism and so on, where we absolutely got no interest uh, in work and no reward and value attached to it at all. It's just... And I just, you know, there's something wrong here, you know. And, um, yeah, so, yeah. Mm. I mean, it's just great to read everybody. It's really great. Really quite touched by it. Mm. I think it is worth acknowledging, Ron, that how the moments, if you don't mind me sharing this, the moments that have been difficult in your career for saying, coming out and saying this kind of thing. And um, just want to acknowledge that and say... Thank you for writing the book that and and follow up books to try and challenge some of these um, ideologies. <laughs> that's, that's been great for me. To, this 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 event's been been great for me. I think I've, I've learned a lot from it. Uh, I think we all have, um, and I'm 
going to just have a couple closing comments and can't really add to anything that any of you said um, in terms of the content. It, that was wonderful and it was great to have such a such lively and, and um, fruitful discussions. Um, just wanted to say thank you to Ron and Sally and Rachel and Shiv for, for making that event happen um, as well and, and putting it together. Um, also, I, if you email back to the host on your Eventbrite, then we just had an idea. I don't know if it'll work out, but if anyone wants to um, create a reading group around either of those books, then we can try and facilitate that. So if you email um, me or I'll put my email in the chat as well now. So you have that, but it also if you email back to the event organizer on Eventbrite, then you'll get that. Um, and we can see if, if something comes out of that, then great. I've absolutely loved reading the books as well. So it's been, it's been fascinating to see how that's been a springboard for such thought provoking and um, important conversations. Um, so I think that's pretty much, I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add, but it's just been really um, important being a part of that. And thank you. Thanks everyone. Yeah, yeah. thanks for everyone who's organized this, I think. Really Thanks yeah, everyone for coming. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to end the meeting on time. Well done, everyone. <laughs> Look after yourselves out there. Yeah, Thanks so much. Yeah, take care, everyone.